afternoon, everybody. I'm Ruth Cadbury, MP for Brentford and Isleworth, um, partly in Hounds, uh, includes Hounslow in my constituency, but I'm also a member of the Transport Select Committee. Uh, I'm very pleased to be chairing uh, the breakout panel. Uh, the short title is Green. The longer title is Sustaining Green Growth is doing what we used to do with less carbon going to be enough. Um, it's a um, transferring trans, uh, transferring our skills and our investment towards green technology, green innovation and green investment uh, is a national priority anyway. Um, and the disruption, if I could put it that way, that COVID has caused our economy and society in, in, in Hounslow and around Heathrow Airport that Niall Bolger uh, described so eloquently as of other speakers. Um, in a funny way, it gives us an opportunity to say, what can we do differently? Both in terms of the airport itself and the airport operations and other operations connected to the airport, but also what can we do around this area um, in other sectors as well? And how can we reskill people and redirect investment and support to that, um, to that wider sense of, of innovation in, in green technology? Uh, and green ways of thinking, because as uh, at least one of our speakers will say, it's not just about technology. It's not just about hardware, it's about ways of thinking. So I'm gonna move straight on. Uh, um, I'm not gonna do a long introduction to the speakers because their biogs are all uh, available there connected to the um, conference program. So my first speaker, they've all got um, three minutes so that we've got some time for your questions and ideas afterwards, um, is uh, the Right Honourable Greg Clark, who's the MP for Tunbridge Wells, uh, but he's also chair of the um, House of Commons Parliamentary Science and Technology Committee. Over to you, Greg. Uh, thank you, Ruth, and it's great to be part of uh, this conference, and, uh, and thanks to Seema for, uh, and the organisers for pulling it together. Um, before we had COVID, um, there were certain, uh, I think, commitments that were made that I was worried when COVID came about that they would be eclipsed and somehow downgraded. Um, be in just over a year ago, uh, I was the Secretary of State in the business department. And two things I remember very strikingly from, uh, from that year of 2019. One was the, the legislation that committed to net zero, um, which was the whole House of Commons coming together to back that. Uh, and the second was uh, implementing an industrial strategy that made a clear joint commitment between government and industry and civil society to advance in areas including clean growth. And actually I'm pleased to, to detect that so far from uh, either of those objectives having been dropped, either net zero or the idea that we need to work together strategically to build industries uh, of the future, I actually think the reverse has been the case, that in some ways COVID is, has accelerated the, the sense of urgency about these things. Climate, because it, it shows that you know, we've had a, a, a major disruption to, uh, to life and livelihoods uh, from, uh, from one phenomenon. Uh, we've got another and we should deal with it. Um, and I think we've also learned through COVID, uh, the vaccine, uh, trials uh, being a case in point, that industry and governments working together uh, is the way forward. So I think that um, the, the, the context uh, is, uh, is very promising for this. Now, as part of the industrial strategy, we're already uh, some way down the road through implementing, for example, the aerospace sector deal that included uh, over £125 million pounds, uh, for the future flight challenge has been referred to today, uh, researching the future of electric flight and, uh, and new uh, fuels. Uh, from the 10-point plan that was uh, announced this week, you can see that work being continued uh, and uh, extended, which I think is uh, very positive. Uh, I think it's also crucial, as Ruth mentioned in her introduction, that we look at the the skills that are required to support any development of new technologies. I think that's very important. Uh, as far as my select committee that I chair, the Science and Technology 
uh, Select Committee, uh, one of our big areas of focus over the next year and the, uh, and the period ahead is to look at the role of science and technology in the recovery from COVID. And I see uh, aviation and aerospace and the attendant technologies, but also skills as absolutely being in scope uh, for that. And I hope that perhaps some of my fellow panelists this afternoon uh, and some, uh, some more of the people that are part of this conference uh, might be able to help us with our inquiry and our recommendations to government over the year ahead. Thank you very much, Greg. That was a really useful opener. So uh, now over to Richard Templer from uh, Imperial College London, who has a, a strong experience in innovation work. Over to you, Richard. Thank you, Ruth. Um, so I do a lot of nodding to what uh, Greg was saying about, um, you know, we, people are paying attention to climate change even more so because of COVID. But let me get on to um, answering. I'm going to be a very good student. I'm going to answer the question, is doing what we used to do with less carbon going to be enough? So I'm a scientist. So let me make the first statement, which is no, we're going to have to innovate. I'm just going to give one example. We burn 15 billion litres of kerosene per year uh, to send planes off to various places. That's Averaged over a year, that's 164 gigawatts of power. So if we were just going to use electricity and forget all about the conversion efficiencies of charging batteries or producing synthetic fuels, we um, would need to more than double the electricity generating capacity of the UK. So the message is we are not going to be able to do these things without innovating. So that's the first message. And it's why I was part of the group that organized this conference. It's one of the reasons we're saying we need to think carefully about an innovation ecosystem because Heathrow and indeed other airports are incredibly important um, to the way that this economy functions and also our relationships with other nations and with other peoples. Okay, so um, that's great. But what does it mean to have an innovation ecosystem? I want to just answer Kwasi Kwarteng's inveighing us to, to not stop discussing here. We need to discuss because we don't actually know exactly what it is we need in this innovation ecosystem. So we want to go through a process of properly understanding the challenges that faced us. We want to do that by asking, knowing what the right questions to ask are. Um, and then when we do that, to be able to do the innovation really well. And what do I mean by that? What I mean in all three of those phases is we have to look at this from all perspectives, not just from my perspective as a techno geek, not just from a politician's perspective or a business's perspective, but also the public's perspective. You know, what is it that actually good, a good future looks like and how can an innovation ecosystem um, help us to achieve that. Okay, and then the I'll just do three um, responses to the question. And the last one is, as Ruth said, I also, even though I'm a techno geek, I want to confess that although innovation, technical innovation is going to be incredibly important, it's only about half of the solution. The rest of this is about us. Um, we all need to understand the basics of climate change. We need to understand how to measure it, how to measure our carbon footprint. We need to understand how our behavior, what we do, interacts with everything else and can have rather perverse effects, can make uh, us doing something good end up being not so good. So those things are to do with more. <laughs> Thank you, Ruth. I'm an academic, we'll go on for a few seconds more. Those are to do not just with technical training, but also with a deeper thing, which is to do with us understanding how to be actors in a new economy. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Richard. Um, so you, I think you got your three points in, but but thank you very much for that. Okay, so now um, Sergey Kisilev from uh, uh, Zero Avia uh, is, I think, is going to talk about uh, a new way of flying planes. 
yes, maybe, not exactly. such a new, maybe not such a new way in your in your way of thinking, but to the rest of us. Thank you. Yeah, the plane the planes are going to fly the same way. You know, they have uh, two wings. <laughs> But uh, yeah, thank you, thank you, Ruth, uh, Ruth and um, uh, thank you for um, uh, inviting us um, uh, to participate here. So we uh, at Zero Avi are contributing to both the sustainability and uh, improving the innovation landscape uh, uh, here um, uh, in aviation in general and uh, in UK in particular. So the mission of our company is uh, to achieve sustainability um, uh, of aviation. Uh, and uh, everybody understands that it's uh, it, it's extremely important to act now because if we don't do it uh, by uh, 2050, uh, aviation can be the largest um, uh, culprit in uh, in emissions, and it can uh, achieve up to a quarter or even a larger share of all uh, human emissions by uh, 2050. We do it by creation of the uh, hydrogen powertrain. So instead of uh, the, uh, the the typical uh, jet fuel or kerosene, we are using hydrogen to um, uh, to produce electricity and then drive um, uh, electrical motor. And we do it by uh, replacing the stock engine of the aircraft with uh, with our uh, uh, hydrogen electric uh, powertrain. Uh, not only um, we create uh, the engine, but uh, we are uh, also taking the holistic approach. Uh, as uh, everybody knows uh, from the electrical car industry, you will not be able to, um, you will not buy electrical vehicle if you don't have uh, the charger. So here we are thinking uh, uh, along the same lines. So not only we are producing them, uh, the engine, but also we are providing the uh, fueling solutions. And this is exactly what um, what we have done uh, here uh, in in the UK at the Cranfield Airport. Uh, we created uh, uh, the holistic hydrogen uh, fueling infrastructure, which uh, has uh, the local uh, hydrogen uh, production using just water and, uh, and electricity. And if electricity is green uh, or coming from the re renewable sources, then um, uh, you will have uh, green or zero emission uh, um, hydrogen, uh, which uh, uh, we utilized uh, for our maiden uh, uh, flight in the largest uh, hydrogen-powered uh, uh, aircraft uh, a couple of months ago uh, here in uh, uh, at Cranfield um, uh, uh, Airport and in, uh, in the university, and um, uh, this was uh, the largest uh, flown um, uh, hydrogen electric um, aircraft uh, in in UK and in the world. And um, our idea is that um, uh, we will um, we will expand. Um, our solutions uh, from uh, the small aircraft we, we have flown, it, it was only six seater, but now we are starting uh, a larger program, which will um, uh, will be able to um, uh, to fuel uh, 19 seat aircraft, which will be able we will be able to deliver uh, for um, for the airline use uh, in about uh, uh, three to four years. So we are looking forward to create uh, at uh, any um, or at uh, at all the uh, or the majority of the airports uh, hydrogen infrastructure, which will be able to fuel our hydrogen electric aircraft, which will be flying uh, uh, all over the world. Thank you. That's uh, really interesting, and I know that people will want to look on uh, Zero Avia's uh, website to to learn a lot more. Thank you, Sergey. So um, now. Sam White, who is uh, from Signal, uh, and he's going to be saying some more about organizational behavior change, um, because it's, as we've said before, it's not just about technology. Over to you, Dan. Thank you, Ruth. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for having me. Um, so, so I'm the CEO at Signal. Um, we're a software as a service, uh, which uh, we're optimizing management feedback to improve performance and well-being in the workplace. Um, we're using methods that are uh, from a subject called behavioral economics, which is understanding the tiny little decisions that people make. And um, we're using techniques that are proven to work against the measured margins of performance and well-being. Um, our team's initial research with Virgin Atlantic um, back in 2016 led to uh, over $6 million worth of fuel savings in just eight months and a world record abatement cost for carbon reduction. Um, so what we're effectively doing is taking operational data, uh, combining that with external data, and we're, we're giving people really accurate personal information 
to uh, to nudge them to make better decisions uh, in the workplace. Um, we're curating this to each individual, and we're also donating money to charity when people hit their goals. So it's a win for the profits, win for the environment, and a win for people as well. Um, so that's what gets me up in the morning. Um, I think, um, I mean, with regards to um, sustainable innovations and how they can be encouraged and championed, um, I think we, I'd return back to the a science of this and, and more so would look to my economist friends for, for help really. Um, I think the UK has some amazing schemes such as Innovate UK, which are, which are truly awesome for helping entrepreneurs take those ideas and concepts and, and make tangible solutions out of them. But ultimately, um, in simple terms, pollution has a cost and a simple regulatory framework would be to create favorable market conditions um, to price and compensate for those costs. So, um, and, and for companies like us that have, uh, we're delivering profit with purpose. I think it can be a little harder sometimes because we're trying to prove additional metrics than just financial returns. So it would be awesome if there are any kinds of incentives that 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 um, that government could find for firms like us that deliver environmental benefits to help the green economy, because I think the UK could really position itself as a world leader. Um, what has been um, my experience, I suppose, in, in, in this in this space, um, and to go back to what Richard said earlier, really, organisations are con uh, composed of people, um, and all of the irrationalities and motivations and foibles that people have and exhibit in everyday life, such as leaving the lights on or not recycling, they're born out in our companies as well. So our understanding of behavior and, and people has often been handled commercially sometimes with a lack of rigor, with assumptions made on rational motives or attitudes or behaviors. We know that people are really diverse and, and ultimately that's what makes us human. So we know that in many organizations, there are massive differences in how people perform. Um, and that's even when we control for external factors. So when we take this to airline pilots or even shipping masters and engineers, these differences are great costs. And if we can address them quickly and uh, um, using our nudging and, um, and techniques, we think that's a really quick way to, to save a lot of carbon. Thanks very much, Dan. Sorry, I forgot to give you the 30 second warning. I was just looking at the Q&A. Um, but that's, that's um, you know, that's really, re really useful. Um, and uh, finally, uh, we've got the Steve Cron uh, from DPD, the delivery company, to say something about what, uh, uh, what carbon saving and, and use of methods and technology means in reality, and I believe DBT is, is using uh, uh, green technology now, uh, and there's an example for us all. Over to you, Ollie. Thanks, Ruth. Thank you for inviting me on this as well. Um, the DPD, we just talked about uh, culture in organisations. Um, at the start of this year, pre-COVID, we changed our three-box strategy that had been the heart and soul of DPD for 12 years and added a fourth box. That was a green box and it was to be the UK's leader in sustainable delivery. We recognised that there was a need to change, to embrace uh, green initiatives and become more sustainable. We are a carbon net, uh, carbon neutral business. We do offset, but we wanted to extend that. We felt there was a moral obligation to lead the industry into the green revolution. And with that, COVID has not stopped us and record volumes due to the lockdowns. Um, we set out a target to transition our fleet, 10% of our fleet to EVs. Um, we only started the year off with 149 vehicles and we are now over 700. So we've moved really quickly with this. We have not slowed down and we will not slow down. We are continuing to move forward. Um, and have recently actually released um, in, in the public domain, it was released, it was in the FT as well, um, our vision 25, 25, 25, and that is to deliver 25 towns and cities across the UK, zero emissions by 2025. So you can imagine the huge uh, amount of work that is needed with that strategy the use of electric vehicles, the charging infrastructure that we need to have within not just the business 
uh, people's homes, public charging for our self-employed service providers. So we do really need to move forward with that. Um, and we have also opened urban depots, three of them in London, in Park Lane, Westminster and Shoreditch, to minimise the amount of vehicles actually driving into the centre of London and minimise the amount of wasted mileage um, with our delivery drivers. And that has been extremely successful. Um, we actually opened one outside of the capital in Hull, which you wouldn't have probably thought um, would be a, a a place to really situate an urban site, but to achieve our 10% of fleet, the depot outside of Hull, servicing Hull, was actually too far due to the range of these vehicles. So we, to ensure that the entire country was 10% EV, we opened up that site in Hull. I know, oh, 30 seconds right. So we also rely fully renewable electricity in our business, 66% recycling, we have an eco fund that is a circular economy initiative utilizing our waste shrink wrap, selling it on and putting that to one side for uh, local community school eco projects. And we have just also um, worked with Forestry England to replant 79,000 trees in Wareham Forest on the south coast after a wildfire as well. So it's not just about the last mile delivery, but obviously an extremely big part of what we're doing at the moment. And we're proving that people can do this. Thank you so much, Ollie, and, and thank you to all uh, all the panelists. Uh, I think, I mean, Ollie has demonstrated what uh, can happen because as a politician, um, we hear a lot about what could happen or what might happen. Um, and I say that as an opposition member, uh, hearing a lot of how, uh, you know, um, uh, you know, we're we're world leading and and world beating, but to, we need to see it in practice. And, and thank you um, uh, to you, Ollie. So I'm going to um, ask the first question, which comes from John Stewart, who I've known and worked with closely for many years, who's a long-standing campaigner against uh, a, a increasing aircraft noise, um, particularly but not exclusively around Heathrow. Uh, and it's a question that that we all, you know challenge uh, we all grapple with but what what chances are there of developing technology that reduces both carbon emissions and noise um you don't all need to answer every question because i think we want to get through as much as possible I, am i would it be richard possibly a good person to answer I, that i can certainly give a have a go at this but i would i'm, I'm looking at sergey although you can't tell that He's over there on yeah, my screen. And I'm thinking that Sergey will also be able to say something. So I, I would say the following in a general high level principle is that um, the efficiency of flight is reduced by the turbulence that occurs as, as the airplane goes through um, the air. It's the turbulence that produces a lot of the noise, I believe. And to make flight more efficient, you have to have surfaces on things like the wings and the and the, the, the main body of the airplane that reduces turbulence. So I believe that the answer is yes, you, you reducing noise uh, is consistent with having more efficient airplanes and therefore lower burns of whatever fuel it is that you're using. But I'm going to now defer to Sergey, who's the true expert. I think that, okay, Sergey, reducing yeah, I, I, I agree. noise. I agree with Richard uh, on a higher level. Uh, about, uh, about uh, the turbulence and the, and the efficiency. So um, in, uh, in our case, for example, when we use uh, hydrogen um, uh, and um, uh, electrical motors, so you will, you will hear only the, 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 the sound of the prop and you will not hear the sound of the engine. So uh, very often uh, when we uh, try to find uh, the most efficient um, regime of uh, flying the aircraft, you almost uh, don't hear it when it uh, passes by. So this is one of the uh, improvements uh, which um, a hydrogen electric uh, can, or you know, electric um, uh, for that matter, uh, can bring to um, uh, to the airports and uh, to people who uh, who live next to them, and uh, that will of course uh, 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 can contribute to enlargement uh, of the number of uh, people uh, and the airports which will be accessible for uh, for the uh, for the air travel. Okay. Um, anyone I, else? Uh, Go on, Dan. 
Yeah, sure. Uh, thank you. Um, I think there are a number of uh, things that pilots can do in, under current conditions to um, reduce engine usage. Uh, so one example that straight off the bat is uh, something called reduced engine taxiing, which is when uh, when a plane lands and it's traveling to the gate, um, it doesn't need all of the engines burning. Um, so that can be applied on going out before takeoff, but it's, it, the engines need to be warmed up. There are certain practices within the flight uh, plan uh, within the flight process as well that pilots can do, but those are all condition and, and, and situation dependent. But there are things from a behavioral standpoint that can be improved that do have a direct impact on noise too. And, and not so much noise, but um, uh, local pollution. Uh, I, on behalf of communities who live very close to the airport, but also the trade unions working at the airport, um, feel there a lot more could be done at Heathrow in particular in terms of reducing uh, fossil fuel emissions by um, the various vehicles, uh, both the heavy duty ones that push aircraft back from the stands, but also the, all the many, many vehicles that, are, that, are, that run around the airport for, for you know, servicing the, the, uh, the airport and, and the planes. So many more of them uh, could be uh, fossil, fossil free uh, and that, that would make for a much better environment uh, as well as obviously carbon saving um, and uh, I believe that um, we are not world leaders uh, in that respect. Um, there's a question, uh, no I, there's another question come in but I want to pick up Richard's point and particularly I guess it's for Sergey um, and uh, well, Richard himself and possibly Dan, is this shocking figure that is effectively saying we can't carry on flying to the extent we were, um, even if we did shift the fuel away from fossil fuels, because there just isn't the electricity to generate either the battery power or um, possibly the um, hydrogen power uh, of, of Sergei's uh, um, model. It, it, you know. What are we going to do about that? Uh, Sergei, do you want to go first? Yeah, go on, Sergey. You know, how how much electricity does it does it take to to get one of your planes, especially if you're scaling up to to, to passenger planes, uh, large passenger planes? So in general, I think that the way you need to to think about this is uh, is slightly different angle. So. Um, you need to look at uh, uh, at the decreased uh, cost of um, uh, generating of electricity, and this is happening due to the fact that, for example, uh, the renewable power generation is becoming more and more competitive, and very often now it's uh, it's actually participating directly in the market. So uh, the overall uh, electricity uh, is going to be cheaper and cheaper. And uh, the price of the uh, electrolyzers, for example, which are used to produce um, uh, hydrogen is uh, getting cheaper and cheaper. So at the end of the day, what we see uh, from, from our forecasts and uh, from the forecasts of the industry is that um, uh, the cost of uh, flying uh, using renewable uh, hydrogen is actually going to be more competitive than uh, even using the jet fuel, okay? So I think that this is this is how you need to look at. So at the end of the day, you will achieve not only uh, zero emissionness, but also cheaper flights. And this is what uh, what we uh, what what we all strive for. So I think I'm gonna I'm gonna just for this not actually just for the sake of arguing, um, but I, I think I'm gonna disagree. I, I, I agree that it's, it, it very probably will be cheaper. The renewables renewable energy is. Has plummeted in price. You, you're basically an idiot now to to do any mining for coal. Um, and you would probably want to get out of gas as soon as you could because everything else is cheaper. It's not a question of cost. It's a question of renewable energy essentially being um, a distributed form of energy. So spatially, it's distributed rather than being concentrated in a mine somewhere. So we've been very lucky. We've had very high energy density, very concentrated forms of energy, which we just pull out of the ground. We've now, we've got to go to a system which it, it, by and large, not entirely, but by and large, is going to be distributed. Um, 
And that means there are limits. There are limits to how much we can put out there. I mean, I'm, I'm not saying theoretically, but I'm saying in practice. People did not want wind turbines in their backyard, for example. So we put them out in, in actually more expensive places out in, 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 in the Atlantic on, on, the, on the continental shelf of the UK. Um, so I, th I, I think this is an open question, Serge. I don't, I don't think this is a, a, you know, that I'm saying this is, you know, there's no way of doing this, but I think we have to be mindful that we need energy from these distributed systems for a lot of different things, for heating our homes, uh, for turning the lights on, for having this conversation, for running our industries and for aviation. And so there will be a moment when, or moments when we, as we go through this transition, when we have to discuss exactly what is it that we prioritize? What are the things that we really need? And that may have an impact on renewable flight. If I can say one other thing, Ruth, which I think is a kind of interesting point, I, I rather disagree um, with the CEO of Heathrow. I think that, that long distance flights, at least for the immediate sort of medium term, may be something that we have to forego because if we've got distributed energy systems, the way to do this may actually be mean that we hop, we go and hop long distances rather than taking a single flight. And the reason for that is the total energy you require for the long flight, if it all resides with the UK, is a huge increase in energy capacity and in generation capacity. Whereas if you hop, you distribute the energy requirements between the UK and, and nations on the way there. Now that may be unacceptable to people. People may not want that. And I think all of those things are the innovations that I was referring to are to do with not just technical stuff, but the interface between technical stuff, market stuff and what people will bear. Back to how we started flying um, over a hundred years ago. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe not as dangerous. It would be nice. Yeah, to yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but uh, you know, those flights that sort of it took several days to get from from uh, London to uh, yeah. Cape Town. Um, I'm going to now um, ask a question that that uh, uh, I, I can see, and I think probably I'll let Greg and Ollie uh, answer uh, to start with. So, who should actually be financially responsible? for delivering the right infrastructure for innovative solutions? The government, the private sector, and or the consumer? Greg. Well, I think it has to be, I think it has to be all. And um, if we think about energy, for example, and it's, um, uh, it's very interesting, very striking that our conversation has been largely about energy um, to, to date. And that hasn't always been the case um, when it's come to uh, aviation and aerospace uh, and transport policy. Um, but energy is, uh, is a good case in point, and clearly the consumer pays for energy, and uh, uh, exactly as been said, I mean, the, the plummeting of the price uh, of renewable energy is something that even 10 years ago, shortly after the Climate Change Act was, um, uh, was passed. You know, I, I remember debates in, the, in Parliament uh, at the same time as the Climate Change Act was passed in 2008, and there was a big battle between government and opposition then um, about building coal-fired power stations at Kingsnorth uh, in Kent. Um, and, uh, and Ed Miliband, a very good friend of mine, was the uh, Secretary of State at the time, uh, and was saying, we simply can't do without it. We know that it's going to be, it's, it's polluting, but we absolutely can't do without it. And things have changed so much um, that uh, the next, or certainly subsequent rounds of auctions for offshore wind are likely not only to, not to be subsidised, but quite possibly will have a negative subsidy. They'll be bidding for the privilege of a contract to give a discount to the market price of electricity, a, a transformation. Now, uh, the reason for giving that example uh, is clearly that involves the consumer in terms of paying uh, bills, um, uh, whether commercial uh, or residential in that case, but it also involves the government. The, 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 the rounds, the auction rounds for offshore wind or the debate that is about to, uh, to take off again about new nuclear power and whether we should give uh, long-term uh, contracts 
and obviously all of these are provided by commercial players. So going back to the point I made right at the beginning, I do think if we're to advance in this way, it needs to be strategic and we need to have a very clear articulation of an industrial strategy. We can't just leave it to the private sector to provide because these things require uh, a regulatory and contractual framework that governments uh, oversee. Um, consumers clearly need to play their part, but they, we need to do it together so that they, they mesh to provide the actions um, that will turn aspirations that everyone agrees uh, with into results that we are now legally obliged to, to meet. Thank you, Greg. And Oli, uh, coming from a, a, a company that is already uh, innovating, um, mm. is there, are there areas where you would be able to roll out more innovation, more carbon saving, if you could get some support from government? Or are you up for invest, you know, using your own uh, investment? Yeah, 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 look, DPD are heavily invested already. Just to put something into context, I won't talk about energy because we seem to be going you know, talking about that quite regularly on, on the call, but a diesel Mercedes Sprinter, typically we can purchase for £25,000. The electric equivalent is £45,000. So huge cost difference. At the moment, they're limited in range compared to an ICE equivalent, obviously, filling up with diesel every so many hundred miles. So I think the announcement... Um, the other day was they're fantastic, but we need more help from government. You know, we need uh, targets for importing vehicles. How many, you know, percentage each year on the build up to 2030 need to be more electric vehicles available. We drive right hand drive vehicles as well, which is not ideal in the market. Um, there needs to be more focus on that. The OLEV grant, for example, was £500 before the 1st of April this year it got reduced to £350. It's only £150, but it's not really incentivizing people to move to electric vehicles. Um, and we, pay for, we pay for our charges at our franchise drivers' homes as well. So look, there needs to be more action. I do believe that industry is a, it's both, you know, but we need more backing from government. We need more money put into infrastructure because that will be the challenge. Um, you know, charging these vehicles on a large scale. Um, and it, yeah, definitely need some more help from the government. And I'm open to anyone contacting me and discussing how we can move forward because it's, sometimes it's quite hard to find the right people to talk to, to open up those doors and move forward. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we really want to be progressive as a business. And I really mean that. Yeah, and I, I chaired um, a conference on Monday on electric vehicles and uh, somebody said very clearly and succinctly, it's not just about the vehicles, it's not just about the charging points, it's it's a whole system, Look, you, you know, it's not going to work, particularly in a complex business such as logistics, if you only get a part of that right, and, and where is the government, say, on um, the fast charging uh, away from the major road network, for instance, and, you know, that's just one example. Um, Richard. Just a very quick just interjection in what, in what you're saying. So one of the things I think is quite interesting is that we, we you know, we, we move things around all over the place. So logistics is, is, is Ollie's you know, company's job. But there are some things as physical objects which perhaps we don't need to, to move. We can move the data for manufacturing them to manufacture them, you know, you designed it over here, you manufacture it over there. And I think there's some real thinking that we should do about whether airports, which we should think of as, as a sort of, um, as the arteries which we reach the rest of the world through, maybe some of it doesn't have to be physically transported, but it can be digitally transported and we can have a different type of relationship with manufacturers abroad. Okay, well, there is the other question about how many of us need to fly quite so often, um, you know, particularly in the, in the UK. Um, uh, the majority of British passengers, or out, UK outbound passengers are leisure travellers and uh, we have a tourism deficit of several billion. 
um, uh, yes, we obviously benefit from inbound tourism and, and inbound business, but the, the, the volume of travel, um, you know, what, what, what's driving it and, and by who and, and, and who's spending the money, and quite apart from the relative uh, cost between a, a, a mid-distance flight and going to the same destination by train, uh, it, there's no incentive on, for us to go by train. Um, so, but that's moving away from, well, is it moving away from technology? Maybe not if it, we're talking about behavioral choices. Um, can I just, now I wanna combine two questions. John Braggins, uh, do you think we can expand Heathrow and still reduce emissions? Now, do we mean emissions just at Heathrow or the UK um, aviation market? And uh, John Krauss asking, what future for smaller regional airports, given the need for investment in new low carbon infra? And I mean, I do know that regional airports are uh, really struggling. And there are rumours that, you know, more than one could literally disappear as businesses um, as a result of COVID, whereas, of course, Heathrow won't disappear, notwithstanding it's, it's the, the current downturn in, in business. So, you know, what, what about um, aviation, uh, Heathrow and UK, uh, in terms of reducing emissions and, and, and how can we support airports, particularly regional airports? Um, who would like to answer that? I, Greg, I, Dan, I, so, uh, I, I, Richard? I'm, I'm very happy to defer <laughs> to Greg. <laughs> you may well, not give... be a minister now, but you are still in the government. Well. It's, it's so good to be able to do this. Off you go, Greg. <laughs> it's, uh, but I'm used to chairing committees. I'm used to being your, your role, uh, Ruth, rather than uh, the, the, the witness to, to this. Um, so I, I think we're at a fascinating time for, for transport. And, you know, the behind your question and your observations, Ruth, are... Uh, absolutely a reflection of the reality that every journey we take by air and but also um, often by land adds to co2 emissions um, and is polluting in various ways um, and so uh, we th th there's a good reason to to reduce uh, our uh, our flying and uh, all the rest of the in that context if we get so this is a, a session on technology if we get the, the technological breakthroughs that we've been talking about, uh, if we are powering our flights uh, by electricity or by hydrogen, and that electricity or hydrogen is generated from entirely uh, renewable uh, or zero carbon sources, um, then the world completely changes. Uh, we don't then need to worry about uh, traveling less and rationing our flights in the way that I absolutely concede that we, we do have to fret about that uh, at the moment. And that's why I think this technology strand is so exciting. It's probably going to happen in energy before transport, but it's, it's kind of one and the same thing in, in a way, but in terms of domestic um, uh, consumption on the ground, as it were, for reasons that our experts know that is a bit easier than fueling uh, a plane that's flying across Europe or around the world. Um, but, but the same thought is going to occur to us on energy. We've all been used to trying to reduce our energy usage. We might get to the point, I thought we will get to the point, it seems to me, it, within the years ahead, uh, in which energy is abundant, both in price terms, it's, it's virtually zero cost um, uh, in terms of the, the marginal uh, cost uh, of it, if we get enough uh, renewables uh, deployed, uh, and in terms of its carbon footprint. And so a bit like we're communicating on Zoom, a bit like the internet, um, kind of always on, completely abundant, you know, more or less unmetered at the moment. We don't think about that. It seems strange to think, but we're not far from energy being like that. And then I think the next thing is that transport could be like that. So the challenge, the policy challenges that we have, are how to progress towards net zero before we've attained that tantalizing possibility. Um, and so 
uh, so technology is really important um, uh, that we should, and those colleagues that have mentioned the need for investment uh, in research, we really do need to accelerate this. But the prospects, I think, are, uh, are transformational. Uh, and then we don't need to worry about we can we can have uh, more airports and we can have uh, regional connectivity and all the rest of it without the um, the implicit uh, uh, concern that's there at the moment. I mean, I, 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 that was very cruel of me saying, Greg, you go first. It gave me it gave me time to think of a bit of an answer. Um, and I, I actually um, I, I John and John Krauss and I go back a little way and, and um, I, I've, I've re replied online, but I'll say it out loud. I think that, um, so our, our plan with, with um, the preliminary set of discussions we want to have and thinking we want to have about creating the innovation ecosystem around Heathrow is meant to involve regional airports because we recognize that Heathrow is not an island entire unto itself, blah, blah, blah. Its function is, uh, one of its functions is to tie the UK in to this artery that can go off elsewhere. So it's clearly important to think about that connection, but not only that connection, not just not just air flight, but but transport in in, in general. And I think um, thereby hangs the sort of uh, a, a discussion that people like like Sergey and, and Dan and Ollie will will be you know tearing apart, and looking at it in real detail. Which if we can be rational as humans which is a big bloody if, but if we can, you'd like to think that we'd be able to think rationally about, okay, we've got this much energy at this level of abundance. I don't think it's going to be infinitely abundance, Greg, but uh, yeah, got it, got it, Ruth. <laughs> but if we've got I'm, being I'm being nagged. Okay, if, if it's at this, this level of abundance, how are we going to share it out? And in particular, from the point of view of getting from Cardiff to Heathrow, to fly out to Iceland, how do we do that? Do, is it better by train? Is it better by electric vehicle? Or are we better off flying? Let the best technologies win. Okay, thank you. I don't know if I've got time to, to let Dan, Sergey, and Ollie have a final word. I'll go in that order because I think that's the order of which you've at least had a chance to speak. Um, and remember, you don't need to just talk about aviation, but we are interested in the Heathrow uh, area community as well. So um, uh, Dan and then Sergey and Olive, I've got time. Thank you, Ruth. Um, yeah, I think um, I think the science is suggesting that we we need to accelerate faster, not slow down. So I, I support a lot of what's been uh, what's been said today. I think, in, in in my opinion, I think there needs to be more of a focus on operational efficiency of what's already there now. I've personally seen, and I know many others have seen, that there are gaps that can be filled very cheaply and very easily with what's being consumed already. But there's no getting away from the fact that technologies like Sergey's and, and Zero Avia's um, are, are crucial to, to aviation's future. So operational efficiency, fuel and hardware, uh, in that order, please. <laughs> okay, thank you, Dan. Sergey, last chance is about 30 seconds. Yeah, uh, thank you. So in general, I think um, uh, the innovation, especially in the capital intensive industries like uh, aviation is, uh, uh, is hard to come by, okay? And uh, hard to support. And uh, we are thankful for, uh, for the UK government, uh, which is supporting us through the ATI uh, grant. And uh, I think that uh, this is, uh, uh, it's, it's important uh, for the capital intensive industries uh, to do the innovation and uh, to show the government commitment, uh, uh, which is you know, visible through the, through the grants like uh, what we are receiving um, and, uh, and others to, to move forward, because otherwise private money will not come. Private money will just uh, stay, you know, the government is not serious in terms of the regulation and supporting, uh, you know, what, uh, what they're saying. So uh, go ahead, please uh, continue supporting uh, us and, uh, and everybody else in the, uh, in this in, the, in this field, thank you. Yeah, I think that's an important message for all innovators. Anything to add, Ollie? The technology is there for transport and final mile delivery, Ruth. We need to invest in infrastructure and reduce the cost of the vehicles to make them available, not just to large organisations, but single, um, you know, workers who can't probably afford a forty-five thousand pound vehicle, you know, to have for their daily business. So, we need to look at that. 
that's a really important message. Thank you very much. And I think my final message is um, up until COVID, um, I always used to say about expanding Heathrow, I'll stop uh, opposing a third runway and more planes at Heathrow when we have the passenger glider plane. I don't know whether the hydrogen plane is, 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 is uh, as good as a, or better than a passenger glider, but noise was always our, our issue. But uh, so this has been really interesting for me. Thank you so much to all my speakers. Um, I know you've been very busy and thank you to all those who've attended and for the questions. Thank you. Thank you.